I'm Nathan, and welcome to Stories with a Twang. Just a reminder that I will be uploading episodes every other week now. I hope y'all had a wonderful Thanksgiving and are looking forward to the rest of the holiday season. I know I am. Our first story is called It Keeps Knocking by Leergaard. A few years ago, my wife and I moved into our dream house. We went to the absolute limit of our budget to get it and have had to cut back on vacations and such until I start earning more at work. But it is the perfect house for us, an office for me to work from home, a huge yard for her to create her dream garden, a nice room for our young son, now almost four years old, and a spare slash playroom upstairs. A three-car garage for us to store all my crap, I'm a bit of a craft supply hoarder, and plenty of room to expand if and when we want to. It's at the end of a quiet, dead-end street, so no through traffic, but we love our neighbors. A few months ago, while we were away for a few days, a pipe burst in the bathroom next to my office. It soaked fully through the wall and completely saturated the carpet. The restoration process was long and fighting with insurance was a pain, but last month my office was finally restored and I could get back to work. While the contractors were at it, we decided to have some additional work done. The office shares a wall with the garage, and I thought it would be nice to have a door there so I could move freely into a workshop I've started setting up. The door is great. I really enjoy being able to step directly out to my 3D printer, laser cutter, workbench, etc. Then, about a week after the restoration was finished, there came a knock at the door. It was while I was working and our son was at preschool, so I assumed my wife wanted to come in through the garage or maybe ask me a question while she was gardening. I was in the middle of an email, so I said one minute and finished writing before opening the door. By the time I did, there was no one there. I meant to ask my wife what she wanted when I saw her later, but I'm pretty forgetful about things like that. So it didn't come up. A few days later, it happened again. Three sharp knocks. Exactly the same cadence as the first. I'd forgotten about the previous incident until then. Again, there was no one there. I stepped into the garage and looked around. Nothing but a chill. I thought of a few rational explanations. I had been listening to a Let's Play video. Maybe the knocking was actually from that. Or perhaps it was the neighbor hammering something and it just sounded closer than it was. It was a little weird, but I wasn't alarmed. Yet. The next night, after I put our son to bed, I was gaming with some friends in the office, and it happened again. It was just a few seconds before I could step away and open the door. It was dark, but the exterior door that led from the garage to the side yard was open, swinging slightly from what I thought was wind. But when it came to a stop all the way open, it fell still. I stepped into the door frame and looked around and didn't feel any breeze, just the cold, still November air. I had a moment of genuine fear but felt incredibly stupid when I realized. My wife was screwing with me. We enjoy horror and occasionally will try to scare each other. Remember that one guy whose wife who wouldn't stop smiling at him? I shared that with her back then and for a while we pranked each other by hiding in weird places with big smiles. It was a good gag but it had been a while since either of us had done something like this. I went out to find her in the living room, pretending to watch The Great British Bake Off or something, but really just doom scrolling, and said, Nice one, you really had me there. She played dumb, exactly as I expected, but I was confident I'd figured it out. I decided the next time she did it, I would jump right up to catch her before she could get away. Sure enough, around midday that Friday, I was finishing up my work from the week when it came again. Louder this time. I leapt up, but I'd forgotten that I had it bolted and slammed face first into it. 
Despite being dazed, I unlocked it and swung it back, but by then she had gotten away again. I looked out the office window expecting to see her racing around the side of the house to the back door, but to my surprise, she was kneeling in the fenced-in garden 50 yards away, halfway through digging a hole for an apple tree. At that moment, a part of me just thought, wow, I didn't know she was that fast. But another part was doubting again. I don't know if anyone is that fast, but maybe I was days longer than I thought. At this point, I decided to just leave the door open while I was in the room, and that worked. There was no more knocking for a week. I closed the door at night when I locked up the house for bed and opened it when I went to work in the morning. I stopped thinking about it. It just became part of the routine. That changed last night around 1 a.m. I woke up suddenly, but wasn't sure why until a minute later, when I heard it. So loud, I could hear it upstairs in bed. It sounded angry now, or maybe frantic. I laid there in disbelief for what felt like an hour, but probably only a few minutes. I shook my wife awake and asked her to listen, but then, naturally, it stopped. Nothing for ten minutes, and she rolled over and went back to sleep. Eventually, I drifted off too, but was woken back up again an hour or so later. I mustered up every ounce of to hell with this energy I could. I grabbed my pocket folding knife from my nightstand, just wanting something in my hand to give me some courage, and went downstairs. I paused in the doorway of the office. I slowly crept up to the door, leaving the light off. Somehow, I thought if whoever was there didn't know I was coming, it couldn't run away before I opened it. I reached the door. I slowly put one hand on the deadbolt and one on the handle, ready to turn them both, and waited. I turned the bolt and knob and flung the door back. It should have hit whatever was banging on it. I held the knife up in front of me, certain that my cheap 4-inch blade would scare off whatever it was. But it was only darkness. In my memory now, it was darker than normal nighttime darkness. It was windowless room darkness, bottom of the ocean darkness. Thick, heavy, stifling. I held my breath, frozen. For ages, nothing happened. After a moment, I swore I heard a whisper, barely audible. I leaned toward the wall of blackness, straining to hear when a gust of wind blew in through the door, powerful enough that it knocked me off my feet. With it came the single loudest bang yet. Then everything was still once more. Finally, I stood and closed and locked the door. When I reached the bottom of the stairs and looked up, my heart nearly jumped out all over again. My son stood motionless on the top step above me, silhouetted by the dim yellow glow of a motion-triggered nightlight behind him. Trying to mask the shaking in my voice, I called to him. Hey, bud. You need something? Are you thirsty? He didn't answer for long enough that I started to sweat. When he spoke, his sweet, innocent voice was eerily deadpan. Thank you. For what? For letting me in. With that, he turned and walked back through the door to his room, shutting it behind him. I returned to bed but didn't sleep. He was uncharacteristically quiet all morning, sitting motionlessly on the living room floor. My wife wouldn't leave his side, checking his temperature, trying to snap him out of it. But I didn't think he was sick. I don't know what came over me, but I only had one idea left. I went to the garage, grabbed a heavy log-cutting axe, and brought it to the door. My wife stepped in to ask me if we should call a doctor, just in time to see me swing it as hard as I could. As soon as it cracked into the wood, my son screamed, a shrill, painful scream from the other room. I've never heard him scream like this before. It was like he'd been wrecked by a pain worse than any his little body had felt before. My wife ran to him, shouting his name. I wanted to follow, but I couldn't stop. 
I swung the axe again and he screamed again. My wife yelled for me to stop, but I didn't. I swung and swung and swung until the door was nothing but splinters. As it broke apart, my son's screams faded and by the time I was done, he had gone quiet. Panting, I crept into the living room, bracing myself for what I would see. My wife was on the floor, shaking him awake, crying his name. I knelt beside her. His eyes were closed. He was drenched in cold sweat. I put my hand on his cheek and he flinched, then opened his little eyes. Daddy? He whispered. My wife sobbed and squeezed him so tight I had to pull her away from him to catch his breath. A few hours passed and we had mostly calmed down, but we have an appointment in an hour to make sure he's okay, but by now he's mostly returned to his normal self. Before I sat down to write this, I stood in my office staring at the carnage when my wife came in. Wiping away a last tear, she laughed out some of the tension she'd been holding in. (laughs) I guess you'll need another door. I contemplated for a moment and took a deep breath. Screw that. Let's just put the wall back in. Our next story is a true story, and it's called Clown with a Knife, from Neon Static. Most people are freaked out by clowns. Me, not so much. True, seeing the box cover to killer clowns from outer space as a kid in my local mom-and-pop video rental store made me shiver with disgust. But thanks to something that happened in my childhood, I'll always have a strong affinity for them. I grew up in Indiana, I was about four or five when this took place, and bog standard in every way, brown hair, buckshot of freckles across my nose, and socks that were perpetually one pulled up, one puddled around my ankle. I tell you this in hopes you understand how perfectly ordinary I was. I was the opposite of standing out of a crowd. Further, the event took place at a birthday party held by one of the other kids in my first grade class. The party was held at a restaurant with an outdoor play area. His mother had decorated the place in streamers and balloons, brought a cake, and hired a clown. It wasn't a large restaurant and a lot of parents, including mine, stuck around. But as a guest at this party and not, in fact, the birthday girl... I blended in with the other kids as the NPCs of the event. Like the bystander effect, I think when several kids gather to be noisy and ruckus and behave like hyperactive goblins, there's a sense of, ah, one of the other adults will see to them. That's how I think the man in the blue shirt finally picked me out of the throng of kids. Or maybe I was just the first one who locked eyes with him as he glanced around casting his gaze across the playground like a fishing lure. Regardless, it was me who returned his gaze, and when he motioned me over, I trotted to him obediently. I assumed he was someone's dad, and thus had that sort of delegated parent authority to summon me like babysitters have. When I approached him, he bent down and asked me, Hi, sweetie. Are you having a good time? I nodded yes. Wanting to get back to my friends, I looked over my shoulder and didn't see the hand he'd used to motion me to come to him close over my own hand. I looked back to the man, surprised. He told me, I have a big present for the birthday kid. Can you help me carry it? It's in my car trunk. It'll just take a second. Come on, be a good helper. It'll make her day. Well, he was someone's dad, or maybe uncle, right? He didn't seem creepy or dangerous. He'd been mixed in with the group of parents standing near the picnic tables and none of them had tossed him out, 
And as a kid, you're kind of in this mode of, if an adult tells me to do a thing, I'd better do it or I'll be in trouble. How could I get in trouble for being a good helper? While I was reluctant to leave the party and my friends, this nice man said it was to get a gift out of the car and we'd be right back to the party. That's why, shooting only a couple of glances back, he began to lead me from the restaurant to the adjacent car park. But then, I saw the clown coming back out from the kitchen area, holding a stack of paper plates and a long silver knife. He began to cut the cake and this is when my kid brain interjected. I was in danger of missing out on cake. That's what had me stopping and trying to pull my hand from the man's grasp. They're cutting the cake. Let me go, I told the man. The man turned, but his placid normal expression from before was gone. I can still see that mask of rage when I close my eyes and think about it. The other details are a bit fuzzy due to trauma and kid memory, but that only serves to drop his snarling face into the uncanny valley territory. It always gives me the shivers thinking back to his face at that moment. I screeched, beginning to cry in surprise and fright from his angry face. I jerked my body like a dog playing tug of war, trying to look at the party, looking for anyone who turned in our direction and could see what was happening. The first glance back to the group was a blur, reds and navy blues of the restaurant's exterior. Then an equally blurry swing of the camera back to my captor, who by this point was clenching his teeth, resteadying his feet from my frantic jerking and flailing. He was trying to hook his free hand around the hand holding me. It was clamping so painfully tight on my wrist it left me sobbing. With both hands now firmly clenched on mine, he tugged me towards him. I was pulled towards him so hard I nearly lost my balance, but I managed to catch myself, replant my feet, and fling my body back and away from him to get another chance to look back at the party. But as I looked back to them, desperate to catch someone, anyone's eye, all I saw were their backs. They were all facing the cake cutting. I was losing steam fast. I remember my lungs beginning to hammer in my chest, pain there mixing with the pain of my wrist and now shoulder. My shoulder felt like it would pop off of me like a doll with detachable arms. My dismay at missing cake had been squashed by the tardy red alarms of stranger danger. The realization that this man wanted to take me was settling in. Beyond that, I couldn't even imagine. It was just this repeat of he's going to get me, take me, get me going through my head. Because at that age, it was the worst thing I could imagine, getting got. I know I was trying to scream, but top volume wasn't an option with my lungs. Battered by my crying and frantic animal in a trap body spasms as I tried to hold on. I couldn't be loud enough to be heard by the party. I felt the soles of my shoes drag as he successfully hauled me farther and farther from the party. Then, over the man's low, angry voice saying things like, Be quiet and stop that, I heard it. A loud, clear voice cut over the din of the crowd. The exciting kids clamoring for cake, my own fading cries. Sudden and clear as a trumpet blast. Hey, what's going on with that girl? It must have caught my would-be kidnapper off guard. He didn't let go of me, but my shoes stopped skidding as his pulling at me stopped. I launched myself backwards once again, turning to see who'd finally noticed. It was the one person facing our direction as he'd had his back to the restaurant to face the crowd and cut the cake. His face was white, save two spots of color on his cheeks, blue half-circle eyebrows, and his big, red-lined mouth painted into a wide smile that looked bizarre with his mouth, as wide open as it was. And thank God he was looking. He was looking right at us. I remember trying to cry out for him to help me, but by that point, I'd be surprised if I had managed a normal speaking voice. Everything hurt. My chest felt locked, crushed. My lungs tapped and struggling to refill. My arm was in agony, a line of Christmas tree lights burning pain in every muscle from shoulder to wrist. 
My neck strained from trying to both jerk away from the man and crane to see the crowd behind us, as though my eyes could communicate what my voice and my whole body couldn't. Help me, please. And maybe it worked, because before the man could gather himself enough to explain it away, do that grown-up thing of somehow always being right and the kid always wrong, the one person to see me was already shifting around the table, rushing toward us. Still holding the long silver knife, the party clown charged. I felt the man freeze as the hand locked on my wrist loosened. I assume he'd released his other hand from atop it, holding it out as though he had a cop directing traffic, warding the clown away with a stop gesture. But that's a guess. I couldn't tear my eyes away from my hero running full tilt to us, Baggy silk costume flapping, big blue shoes making a kathwak sound as his heel hit the ground, followed by the flipper-like toe box. Have you ever tried to run in flippers? It's hard as hell. And that explains how he tripped, falling forward, his hands coming out in front to catch himself. One hand empty, the other still armed with a knife now coated in cake frosting. Like a guided missile, the blade connected at the juncture of the man's hand and my wrist, topside on the forearm. It was dull, but the weight of the tumbling clown drove it to cut, and blood flew. The man released my wrist with a cry. I fell toward the party, no longer supported by his pool. An angry red line welled up blood on my arm, but I couldn't feel any of it. My eyes were locked on the bright rainbow-colored costume body colliding with the man as they both fell to the ground. Someone was yelling. A lot of someones were yelling. Then I felt two hands clasp on my waist as an adult, my adult, my mom, picked me up, pulling me away from the man and the clown now tussling on the ground. Then a rush of more grown-ups blocked my view as they joined the fracas, and my face was turned to my mom's. Her face looked like the clown's, in what I remember. This was the early 90s, so her blue-green eyeshadow, hot pink blush, and matching lipstick were more in line with fashion than the circus. But her face was pale, eyes wide, lips looking impossibly wide as she gaped at me in terror. Then I buried my face in her shirt and just sobbed. I don't remember much else about that day. The police were there at some point. A nice lady, either an EMT or a cop, bandaged my arm after telling my mom I was lucky. The cut wasn't as deep as it could have been. Kids kept coming over to peer at me, clumsily pat at me, saying, Sorry you got hurt, over and over. The man was arrested and taken away. For all of this, I was clamped to my mom, legs and arms unwilling to let her go. But when I saw them taking my hero, I sprang away and bolted to him afraid that they were also arresting him for the cut on my wrist. The policemen explained that the clown was not in any trouble, and they just needed to talk to him. They made a big show of not putting the clown in handcuffs. By now, he'd removed the frizzy blue wig, and his makeup was surely smeared. But little kid memory, he looked perfect in my mind. So there you have it. A story about a clown armed with a knife who wasn't the bad guy. I've asked my mom about this since, but there wasn't much to tell. The man who tried to take me had a record. He pled guilty and went back to jail. And to this day, when I think about a hero or a guardian angel, I picture a clown. Knife optional. All right, everyone, that's it for this week's stories. I would like to give a giant thank you to this week's two incredible authors. If you have any stories you would like me to read on the show, you can send them on over to storieswithatwang at gmail.com. The show is on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at storieswithatwang at gmail.com. It would mean an awful lot if you could rate and review the show wherever you listen, and don't forget to share with your friends and family as well. It could really help the show grow. I hope you all have a wonderful week, and until next time, remember that a little twang goes a long way.